face the dead. I'd like to welcome Mr. Drew Sidler to my stage right now. Drew, how you doing, buddy? Good, buddy. How are you, man? Thanks. It's Sunday. We made it, brother. All right, go ahead and do your thing, brother. All right, guys. Thanks for coming to Kevin Fever panel today. We have uh, both Jordan Ladd and James Bella. Kevin Fever, let's bring them out. But he, 
yeah. I guess he, you know. He spent up like a week before. They didn't understand. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. He did get arrested. There was a, there's a cover of New York Post that says, dude, you got to sell. He got, he got, he got, he got uh, yeah, he got busted in, like, Union Square with a joint. He went to jail. <laughs> yeah. Oh, New York City. Um, but yeah, it was great to work with. Um, and, you know, it's nice to be with somebody that knows, even with somebody's first feature, to know exactly what what tone they're going for, what mood they're going for. And it helps with, you know, direction. Somebody, you don't know, you're, you're like, ah, how should I play this? And they have an idea. It helps you out a lot. What was the location like in the backwoods of, uh, of, of North Carolina and you know, having to be out there so long? Any, uh, any problems with that? Um, we shot in two different places in North Carolina. We shot on a stage in High Point, North Carolina, which is the furniture, well, well at that point it was the furniture capital of the world. It was just like furniture market, really. Like, you know, like just, that's all that was there. And then a strip club, not like in McDonald's. Um, <laughs> The local ballet. Um, and, then, and then we shot in Mount Airy, well, near Mount Airy. The cabin was in the woods of, in the, I guess, the ridge of North Carolina. Um, and Man Air, Mount Airy is an interesting town. It's, it's, it's a complete replica of Mayberry, because uh, he was born there. Uh, the guy starred Mayberry, what's his name? I'm liking. Um, so they made it, it looks Andy like. Griffin. Andy Griffin, yes. So he was born there, and then they made the town look exactly like that TV show. So it's like, it's pretty trippy. Yeah. Um, and then we all stayed in the one house, like a bed and breakfast. It's a lot of fun. It's cool. It's nice when you have that. It's like big, you know, vacation. Do you remember we went? We went into it's very like big. yeah, and somebody fired off a shot oh, it's a, it's a, it's in the order. middle of the bar, like ksh, their so shot we went gun. to a karaoke night in the middle. Of this one little bar, they like Monday karaoke, and everybody was there in their hunting gear. And like, at one point, a fight broke out, and the owner, to stop the fight, fired a pistol. And I said, man, we're in the South. This is the South. <laughs> to break it up. It's quite effective. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming it was a blank, but... <laughs> Oh yeah, karaoke night turned into <laughs> It's pretty crazy. And then Eli sang, everything was going okay. We looked a little weird because we obviously, I think hunting season had just started, deer season or elk season, buck season. Um, but we were in normal clothes, everybody else was in their hunting gear, but it was fine. People were really nice to us. Um, until Eli sang, uh, he did Rocket Man, but he did it, the William Shatner Rocket Man. I don't know if you guys have ever seen William Shatner sing Rocket Man or the you can do the Family Guy Rocket Man. Um, and and it really creeped people out. <laughs> they had no idea. This is pre-internet, you know, 2001. Right? Weird thing too is the head of our transpo department had been the ex-president of the, that chapter of the KKK. Oh, but, yeah, yeah, but, and I think Eli was his first Jewish friend, but he loved Eli. He, I mean, he really, he really turned it around, and his kid was one of the drivers, and um, he had a black girlfriend, so he kind of quit the chapter of the KKK, and I think, like, now he has some black friends and some Jewish <laughs> friends. In this movie had a particularly interesting one, I think. It was uh, Santa Claus that sounded like Paula Deen a little bit. <laughs> That's a very accurate description of Robert Harris. What, what was he like on, you know, on, scrum, on uh, behind the scenes and stuff? When did you meet him? And just, well, you're blown away as, as we were as an audience of his sound and his look clashing so much. Well, he made, but his lines, because he, he's in a, he's a more advanced stage and he's with us, thank goodness. And I've seen him. I saw him two years ago, 
It was wonderful to catch up with him. And he's such a dear, sweet um, soul and a real artist. But he, you know, he's advanced age, so he knew the scene, but it, he started making up his own dialogue about Shirley Temple dolls and <laughs> Lady Head palsy so fat she began to shake. And it was so even better than the script, and we're like, he's gold. And Eli was like, this is so good. And the script was good, but he like really embellished and came up with some stuff we we'd never heard before. So he was pretty fantastic. The local. We all really pretty much fit our roles very well. You could make them, you know, make it your own. Yeah. I mean, um, we weren't really at odds, but. <laughs> no, we weren't at odds, no. Um, but, uh, yeah, Joey's the train stick screaming next. He really took it, <laughs> <laughs> he took it, you know, full on. But no, Joey's actually the you know, nicest, sweetest guy since so that Yeah, yeah, like a, he's got money or, yeah, I don't yeah, know, yeah. he's snotty in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, he's definitely not that way in real life. He's kind of fun. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think I'm right. he's, a, he's a teddy bear. Yeah. He just sounds gruff and rough. <laughs> we, actually, we were on the flight together coming to North Carolina. And it was just after 9-11. And I already was a bad flyer. Like, I still am. I'm scared of flying. Um, but uh, right after 9-11, the last thing I wanted to do was get on an airplane. And we'd never met before, but I was aware of who he was from like Detroit Rock City. And so I spotted him at the airport bar. And I go, I'm Jordan. I'm in the movie, too. And I said, I'm really scared to fly. Can I sit, sit next to you? And will you hold me? And I literally basically got in his lap shivering, and he was like, nice to meet you. Like, who is this lady? There's a Xanax. <laughs> there wasn't enough Xanax. I was still not scared. <laughs> There's always no Xanax. I think that was actually like, it was a contractual thing. I like this actress is fine with you. You have to hold her. Yeah, hold her. <laughs> So, Jordan, you got to live out the dreams of countless teenage girls in 2002, uh, playing the love interest of uh, Ryder Strong. I had no idea. I had never watched Boy Meets World, and at one point, I guess, Ryder was covered in blood, and we're shooting a scene, we were, like, by an actual campsite, and he rounded the corner and with blood all over him, and there were a ton of um, Girl Scouts or something, and they were screamed because there was this guy covered in blood, and then it was that blood curling, curdling teenage fan scream when they realized it was Boy Meets World, Ryder Strong. Yeah. So I, I, they got a double pleasure out of that. But I, I had no idea. I mean, people still, when they come over to my table, are like, oh, you got to meet, you know, you got to kiss Ryder. And my ex husband at the time was off on one side watching Ryder and his girlfriend on the other side was watching me when we were kissing. It was like the most unromantic, <laughs> awkward kissing scene ever because we were being mad dog by our respected mates. But, um, uh, but then I saw Ryder a couple of years ago and he, he like has a man face and I'm like, damn, he's hot. I was single at the time, and I just, I hadn't really, he was a boy to me. And I was with somebody else, and he was with somebody else, and I never looked at him that way. But two years ago, I looked at him, and I thought, oh my god. God, I want to go there. But he had a girlfriend. No, he's married. Right? With oh, a kid. Boo. He has a kid? I think so. Wow. I just throw that me off. Really not for Jordan just now. No, no, I have a boyfriend. I'm good. We're good. It was, it was like a mo just a fleeting moment of 
I saw him the way that girls see him. Yeah, little boys sometimes. Or and boys. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right, where are we at? James, you had a you had on that said F U on it the entire. Was that supposed to be tongue in cheek, or was that an actual school that you knew about? Um, no, it was F F U. I believe it was supposed to mean fuck you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to make sure. Well, basically, what that happened, we went to a bar. Uh, and there was a band playing, and I said, the, the lead singer had that, this hat on that said, F you. I was like, I want to wear that hat in the movie. And pretty much, the reason you wear a hat in a movie is because you want to get your, give yourself an extra 30 minutes to sleep. Because then you don't <laughs> have so to get true. your hair done, and you got to go through like hair and makeup. Now you just need makeup, you got a hat. So you're like, uh, 8.30? Uh, how about that? Um, <laughs> But I also thought it was a great hat. The producer went up to the band and said, hey, we're shooting this movie. You know, this is weird. Um, you mind if we borrow your hat for four to six weeks? Um, we borrowed it. They ended up being in the movie, in the end scene, like the banjo party scene. And two of their songs are in the film as well. So it was a win-win for everybody. It was crazy. They ended up like they were. It was a small little town in North Carolina, or not little town. Uh, Greenville. Green. No, Greensboro. Greensboro. So that's it. Um, but then they ended up moving like two blocks from me in Los Angeles. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I'd see them in a bar all the time. Like this is such a trip. Um, I think I ended up getting a copy of that hat, but I lost it. Okay. There was a guy here this weekend that had one made. Yeah, that's how that, that story came out. But yeah, it was supposed to be fuck you. Yeah. Well, it was really just because you didn't get your hair done. Exactly. <laughs> but, well, you know. So the officer, Officer Winston in the film is the exact opposite of every uh, police stereotype. <laughs> why, why, why was he? Why was he portrayed that way? I don't know. I can't get it. Right. Because Eli's got taste. I mean, <laughs> Giuseppe Andrews is one of the most brilliant, but far out people, like kind of like Crispin Glover, far out, like... I think he's farther. He's farther than Crispin Glover. Um, I worked with him on Never Been Kissed, and I thought he was gonna, he has this look like he's in an alt band, and he's gonna be the cool guy, and he was wearing vintage white suits, and, and he's just far out. And uh, so I was really excited to hear that he was cast in our movie, and um, and then as a as a person, he he showed up with like a little doctor bag with a pair of clean underpants and a toothbrush in there, and that was it. And um, and he was a success with the local was, local ladies yeah, too. Yeah, the is it. Um, <laughs> I did a I he, he was in Detroit Rock City as well. Um, that was a that was a ninety five day shoot. He bought, we got to Toronto, he went to Queen Street, which is like a shopping street in Toronto. He had a leather outfit made, brown leather outfit. <laughs> he didn't take it off for 95 days. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, it didn't smell bad, but, I mean, those, those, those leather pants probably could walk. Um, he's unbelievable. The whole time he like, there's uh, the director of Detroit Rock City's here, and he made a documentary that you can get on iTunes or on Amazon Prime, I think for free, you can watch it. Um, it's called Giuseppe Makes a Movie. Like, please watch it. It's, I mean, it's unbelievable. He is probably one of the most interesting people. I, I, he's definitely the most interesting person I've ever met. He lives in like a trailer park and does these little movies. With homeless with people. With homeless people. And, and, like, and they're based the on Harlequin romances. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like kind of like a David Lynch yeah, I mean, type. Yeah, he told me he was living that. in a shed at one point. His dad <laughs> lived in the trailer, and he lived in a shed. Yeah. I mean, you know, he lived yeah, in the trailer park with his dad. I mean, and this is after he did a TV show. Uh, he was in Two Guys in Cool Pizza Place. He was working a lot. He was in also in a... Uh, He's like Independence Day, he's in a lot of films. And he was like, yeah, man, I was, you know, on the 
the shot. floor of my dad's trailer. Uh, and he only has one outfit because he's not spending it on clothes. So <laughs> but yeah, supposedly I've only seen one of his, a uh, couple of his films, but he's made like 400 of them, and they're all supposed to be unbelievably amazing. Uh, he, he makes, and he also he makes the non-loved people the star, treats them like a star, and, you know, gets some crap service and gets some coffee and like makes them feel like they're movie stars, and it's pretty awesome. So. Please try to check that out. I will try to check that out. That's that's a sell. That sounds great. Tonight. You should on the airplane. Um, and 
you know, it was, it's a lot of work, but the guy that was applying um, the appliances on me uh, was a really sweet guy, so we got to spend a lot of time together in that process, and they're real artists, what they do, K and B effects, um, and they worked also on, on Death Proof, uh, they do all Quentin stuff and all of Robert Rodriguez's stuff, so they're real artists, and the guy was super nice, thank goodness, because we did spend a lot of time together. It was tough with makeup because it was cold and that stuff like freezes. And it's it sticky. Very, it's sticky and then it like gets hard and it takes forever to get off. I don't know. I so, I you remember that, it was shaving cream. Yeah, shaving cream. The cheaper the better. Barbasol takes that blood stuff right out of your clothes, your hair, everything. And if you need to know that. Yeah, it's good to know. Right? <laughs> Any more uh, questions from the audience? Go ahead. My favorite scene, I stopped, when I died, I would leave rehearsals <laughs> because I was dead. Why do I have to be there? I didn't know anything that happened. I stopped reading the script after I died. So everything after I died, I love. I especially like the deer scene. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah that was my favorite. I laughed out loud. I was sitting at the premiere of oh, like a screening, and my friends are like, "Why are you laughing so hard?" I was like, I've never seen it. They're like, "Really?" I'm like, no, I didn't know what happened. I was dead. <laughs> I, I think I like the climactic, climactic ending. Like, I got probably a lot of actors love the stuff that they're not in because there's no self judgment involved, and you're not watching yourself or thinking, "Oh, I could have done that differently or better." Or, um, but I love the climactic ending, and especially the guy that's got the box, uh, the kit, um, and the whole Jimmy really with the cell phone. Oh, it's his mom. <laughs> we'll make an exception. Um, uh, but when when Joey gets shot, he says, "It made it, it fucking made it, it made it, it made it," and he blows up like that. That was a favorite. And also when they were throwing all of our bodies and burning our bodies. I saw, it was really artful the way they did it, and we had an amazing DP and crew that would lay tracks down. We were shooting on film, so everything took forever. Um, but they were so fast, and we get 42 setups a day, which is unheard of. Um, but the, the shot is, they laid a bunch of tracks down, and, it, and the camera travels, and they're throwing dummies on the fire, and then they want to make it look like they're put, throwing a fresh body on there. And so they took, I think it was Joey, and picked him up like they were throwing him on there, and the camera swipes and moves in the right amount of time, and then when it comes back, it's already burning and you see the dummy burning. But it was a lot of kind of choreography and swapping people out, and it just was this magical timing, and I realized what, we, gosh, we're like, this isn't just some dumb movie, like, this is a film. Like, these people are actually, Filmmakers, and so that was really cool. And we were shut down in the middle of the show, and I and really I thought this is going to be a turkey, a turd, or this is going to be awesome. I really didn't know. And when we were shut down, we got to see some of the dailies, um, and uh, it was right in the middle of a strike. And so the unions came down and said nobody could go to work. And um, we, we saw footage and it looked so spectacular. It was a real movie. And we were, I was scrambling to see if I could get money and get non-union crew people to fly themselves out to work on it to just get us up and running again because once I saw the what had been shot, I was so floored. I thought, we can't walk away now. I mean, this is beautiful. This is like a real movie where these people really know how to make a beautiful frame. And every frame in the movie looks like a piece of art, really. So, a painting, so, um, but it got, you know, the crew said, oh, forget the union, let's keep going. So we got lucky, within three days they rallied and every, we got back up. But uh, it was, it would have been a shame to walk so away from that also, that whole period happened over Thanksgiving, so it wasn't, you know, we were, yeah. Oh yeah, we had Thanksgiving together in North Carolina at somebody's house. Yep. Forgot about that. I love a big Thanksgiving fan. And, and uh, Eli's parents were there. Yep. Times. It's delicious. <laughs> Who else in the audience has a question? Good. Yeah. I got one more question. So, what's 
So, who is your favorite director to work with, and uh, why? Mm -hmm. Me? I both of you. Both of us. Okay. Uh, my favorite director to work with. Um, um, I mean, it's tough. I can say, you know, when you do your first film, you always know, have like sort of I have a connection. So like Adam Rifkin, that's here. Um, I mean, that's this, it's not necessarily favorite, but that's my most memorable. And so, and also working with a director that you know I never didn't know what I was doing, right? So they helped me throughout that you know journey. Uh, so I guess I could get it in. Pop my cherry. <laughs> um, I mean, I can't say like because I've gotten to work with some really stellar people, and I love them for different reasons. But going totally fan, I, it, it's still surreal to me that I got to work with Quentin Tarantino, and. He's exactly like you think he is and how he is on TV. And he's that enthusiastic and when the crew would get tired and he'd pump up the music while we were in between takes and then he'd yell out, why are we here? And, and we'd all have to stop and go, because we love making movies. <laughs> and so, like, I, mean, I, I don't know, like for me, because I'm such a Quentin fan, and every movie he makes becomes my new favorite of his, so it was obviously, you know, I, well, Kill Bill, and then I saw Glorious Bastards, and I went, oh, this isn't officially his best movie. And then after that, it was Django. And I've seen all his movies four times, so I'm still, like, not starstruck by him, per se, as a person, but as a filmmaker and an artist, I, he really is, like, him and Martin Scorsese to me are the greatest living American directors, period. Hands down. Like, I, they don't know how to make a bad movie. So. But that's my diplomatic answer, too, because, you know, I love Greg Rocky and Eli and uh, Paul Sala for other reasons. You know, I could go on and on about them for different, you know, reasons why I like them. But, but I'll say Quentin because he's Quentin, you know. Well, I just want to thank both of you guys for your yeah, time. Yeah, thanks, you guys. Give it up for uh, Jordan James. Thank you.